got a message on on Zoom that says, uh, "If Did they you, see you, I think so." Yeah. Okay, cameras on. Okay, yeah. If you are visiting Menji next time, there's uh, David from Zoom chat says he'll be your guide. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> or I could, I could be. You could also be my guy. Yeah, I could uh, go with David yeah. and be your guide. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we'll start in um, five minutes. So just uh, get people settled in. And uh, we'll get started with the introduction and uh, welcome our guest speaker today. Can everyone hear me on Zoom? Mic check. Great. Thank you, Siram. Simran. Thank you. <clears throat> Have a good crowd today. Um, the room is filled. So that's a. Uh, uh, it's a new sign for a great new years coming up. So a lot of uh, guests today. How many people have you got? Uh, you we have uh, 21 online. guests online. Have, just do a roll call. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. There are 13 guests in total in the room. Uh, I think that's a new record since I've been with uh, CIE. So. Fantastic. Yeah, always the funky stick. I think it's close to seven, there'll be no more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that uh, hockey stick analogy in the in the climate topics with the uh, global temperature rising. Mm -hmm. uh, very sharply in the recent years. <laughs> it looks like a hockey stick. Right now, these days, everything is exponential. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that could be unstable, right? That could be. <laughs> right. Well, that's why it causes all the disruptions. Mm. So when the thing is too high, goes too fast, right. it's no longer linear. You know? Right. You need to have a negative feedback in that case to <laughs> control the system, right? So. Okay, I think we're Good to go. Um, we're two minutes early from 6.50. So I'll get go ahead and get started with um, uh, today's uh, CIE uh, speaker series. Uh, so welcome um, to the Chinese Institute of Engineers, uh, San Francisco Bay Area chapter. Uh, today, we're really excited to welcome uh, Dr. William Kao back to uh, this New Year speaker session. Uh, today, we'll talk about a lot of really exciting things for this year. Um, new technology trends and prediction. I think everyone's very excited about what's going to come um, in the coming year. Um, so 
let's get started on a little bit of the uh, history of uh, the Chinese Institute of Engineers. I think a lot of you have seen this slide, but basically this is a um, really old, um, but also uh, carries a, a lots of uh, uh, historical uh, significance to the Bay Area and uh, Chinese Americans in the US uh, in general. Um, the organization was founded in 1917 uh, in Cornell University um, by uh, uh, the famous um, railway engineer, um, Zhang Tianyou, uh, who was a uh, very well celebrated uh, Chinese American who, who has uh, spearheaded the design of a lot of uh, um, cutting edge technologies back then when railway was the biggest uh, uh, industry uh, around the globe. And until now, uh, in 2024, uh, we've seen uh, definitely a lot of growth in the organization, as well as the participation of uh, um, members um, from CIE uh, in the entire uh, Silicon Valley, as well as the technology world. Um, the Bay Area chapter has participated um, as a nonprofit organization serving engineers, scientists, and students uh, in the Bay Area engineering community. And the mission of CIE is to promote uh, technological advancement. Um, we will be very inclusive and have networking opportunities where people can um, expand their network as well as their professional career. Um, and most importantly, communications between engineers and scientists who have a lot in common and have a lot to share together and promote the well being of the engineering community. And uh, we have seen uh, lots of uh, conferences and ceremonies that, that CIE has participated in. And some of the most uh, famous people uh, and that we were fortunate to inviting in and, and participate in the CIE uh, events, um, including uh, the NVIDIA CEO, Jansen Huang, and the CEO of AT&T, Annie Chow. And uh, it's definitely exciting times indeed. Um, and in the past couple years, there's uh, the, uh, the virtual events that have happened, uh, including some of the speaker series that uh, are happening uh, uh, continuously. Um, and above and beyond, um, lots of uh, conferences and uh, communication and outreach programs that uh, were organized in order to promote the community as well as uh, building networks uh, around the Bay Area for Chinese Americans um, and uh, all of the engineers in the Bay Area and beyond. And here's some more pictures of the uh, activities that have been um, happening um, around the area. Um, the CIE organization is also um, um, supported by many industry leaders um, and companies in the Bay Area in the world, uh, ranging from financial sectors to technology sectors. Um, so there, there's a few technical groups um, within CIE. Uh, there's the Emerging Technology Group, um, specifically also towards the electrical engineering and computer science groups. Um, there's the electronic te design technology groups and the uh, biomedical engineering group. And of course, there's the emerging tech people, young CIE uh, group. Um, there are different ways to reach out and get connected with um, the CIE San Francisco chapter. And the provided links uh, here and the QR codes are the ways for you to get connected via um, the internet um, for, uh, for future events and uh, future speaker sessions. So without further ado, um, let's introduce Dr. William Cowell, um, who received his uh, bachelor's in electrical engineering, a master's in electrical engineering, and a um, um, PhD from the University of Illinois, Urban Champaign. He has worked in the semiconductor and electronic design automation industry for more than 30 years. And he has hold lots of senior and executive engineering positions at different companies such as uh, Text Instruments, Xerox, um, and um, recently Cadence Design Systems, which a lot of people use. And personally, I've been using Cadence for uh, for many years in my career and further in education. Um, um, he's published a, a lot of
some technical paper and has a definitely has a background in which uh, many uh, young engineers some Dr. William Cal of course. Sure. Can people on Zoom um, see the slides? Okay. All right. So uh, welcome to uh, 2024's uh, first technical seminar. Uh, I think uh, both today and tomorrow we're taking a break from the rain. So I'm glad that uh, you can make it tonight. <laughs> okay. So tonight's presentation is going to be on 2024 technology trends and predictions. Uh, this is the agenda for uh, this evening. Uh, I'll give a brief introduction about uh, new technology and uh, the new year. Uh, and then we'll dive into the top 10 uh, technology trends for the year 2024. Followed by that, I'm going to cover, go a little bit more strategic. So instead of just talking about the year 2024, I'm going to talk about the top technologies for the entire 20 to 2030. All right. So we are right now 2024. We're beginning, sort of like beginning still in the first part of uh, the decade. So that this is a little bit more strategic, okay? So it's not going to be beyond 2024 up to the year 2030. And then wrap up with a summary and conclusion. Okay. So the year 2024, uh, every, every January, my first talk of the year is also about that year's technology trends and predictions. So at the beginning of the year, you sort of like do a forecast about what's to come or what we predict will be hot this year. And sometime in the September, October timeframe, I do a wrap up or say how, what went on during the year. Okay, so there's always like two bookends. The starting bookend is the prediction and sometime in the fall, I'll talk about what went on. Okay, now this material that I'm presenting tonight is something that I've gathered and collected from various sources. So, you know, I'm I'm retired. So I don't have like a staff of, of people who can gather all the information for me. So what I do is I read everything that is out there. And all the material that you see here has been compiled and published in some way or another by large R&D organizations or think tanks. Okay, Gardner Research, Forbes, Forrester Research, IDC, McKinsey, and so on. So all these are well-known and well-established uh, entities. So just to give a quick summary of what is hot in 2024, and then what I'll be covering in terms of the technologies for the decade, okay? In 2024, last year we talked about, everybody is talking about generative AI, right? So generative AI, I'll be still covering uh, generative AI, uh, talk about the convergence of the real, the physical and the virtual. That means the, the real world and the digital world, okay? That's becoming more and more blurry because they're each is getting to each other and there is now a mixture. Just like in the news, you have the real news and the fake news. You cannot distinguish them anymore, okay? Uh, talk about advanced connectivity, connectivity from the mobile and uh, overall in the internet from Wi-Fi to cell phones to up to satellites, okay? Also, the complement between the cloud technology, I know we've been living with cloud technology for about close to 10 years, everything we get it from the cloud, right? 
Well, right now, the, for the last two or three years, the focus has been on the edge because now you need to have real-time uh, response. And you cannot wait for the latency to go to the cloud and get the information back. Okay. Cybersecurity, of course, is always an issue because as things are on the, on the internet, people are always afraid about security, privacy, and so on, right? Uh, green technologies is also sort of resurging now because right now everything requires so much compute power. And the compute power means that you have to consume a lot of uh, energy. And, and if you're using too much energy that are polluting the environment, it's not good. So green technologies is sort of like reviving uh, again. It was really hot about 10, 10 to 12 years ago, and now it's coming back. Uh, things like quantum computing. Quantum computing and so on is a little bit like nuclear fusion. It's always like, well, it's coming, but it will be like 10 years. So it's always 10 years away, okay? But, but again, quantum computing is against, everybody's radar right now. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about quantum computing, about the basics about quantum computing, and then we can, in the Q&A, we can discuss about how far we are from the reality, okay, from the practical use of it. And biometrics. So right now, that's also, it's been hot for many, many years. So there are more and more different kinds of biometrics, as I will explain. Within the decade, so going beyond this year, going to the whole next 10, within the next 10 years, up to the year 2030, there's more and more called RPA. RPA stands for Remote Process Automation. So that means that everything is being automated, okay? Uh, uh, and the other thing is that also the other trend is that it's getting more and more distributed. So before it used to be centralized. Now everything is distributed. From blockchain, everything is distributed. Computation is also no longer just the servers, but also it's all over the map. It's actually going from the cloud to the device. The device meaning that it's everything that we're holding on our hands, okay? Uh, also, the advancements are not restricted to the IT. It's also in the bio, in the bioengineering area, okay? like genomics and uh, also uh, new ways of doing farming. Okay, all of that I cover a little bit. Uh, next generation computing, that's the area where either you can say, well, that's where uh, quantum computing comes in, but there's more and more new materials. So that's another thing that is very important. It's not only just the more speed in the computer, but also your discovery of new materials, okay? Okay, so all of this will be covered in tonight's uh, talk. So first one, AI everywhere, okay? AI every day, everywhere, okay? It's sort of like, you know, it's, it's, everything is pervasive, okay? So uh, back in last year, 2023, was the first year where uh, gen generative AI started. Okay, and right now we're already one year over it. And starting in 2024, there will be increasing more and more applications of generative AI. Okay, so we'll cover that. And for this one, I'll dive in a little bit for people who are actually coming in just to hear about the AI. Because everybody said, every time I, I give a talk, it's like, well, what's the latest? And there's always a lot of things happening just within one quarter. So I'm going to call, talk for the people who came into this talk just to listen about AI. I'll give you some of the latest. And I'm not sure even you have heard about it. So I'll talk about it. So you, you won't be disappointed for if you come to hear about AI. Okay. Um, so uh, generative AI will move from the, oh, the discovery. Oh, there's a generative. That means it's creative. It's generating new things to what fields it's being used upon, okay? Uh, and also people say, well, I'm going to lose my job to AI, okay? So everything that after my talk, you're welcome to ask me any questions. I have some viewpoint that 
you may or may not share my viewpoint, but at least I'll be able to discuss it with you, okay? Generative AI, it not only generates text, when we started with the chat GPT, you just go and type in a question, it gives you back text. So right now, generative AI, it extends beyond just text. It goes into image generation, it goes and generate, it can generate code, it can generate video, okay, and so on. So it's right now, it's not only text generation, okay, it's a sound, audio, code, and so on, images, video. And the areas where this thing is being used right now the most is in sales and marketing, okay. Pretty soon, they're going to do away with a lot of the bankers and assistants because you can use just a chat GPT and it can tell you everything you want to know about certain area without having to have a person do it, okay? Um, so customer operations, marketing. Uh, a lot of people actually use uh, for, for software development. They say, well, either they, they write the code and then submit it to chat GPT and say, correct it, all the things that, or find all the bugs, okay? Or improve it, okay? Or right now there are some people say, well, let me just describe what I want. And then the, the thing will generate the first pass of it. And then for, through successive refinements, you can improve the code, okay? So there are some people say almost pretty soon it's gonna be no code. Right now it's a low code or improved code. Okay, right now I would say it's between the human and the chat GPT. Okay, in between they work it out. Whoever starts first, you iterate, okay? Okay, so just to look at the, where does generative AI fall within the whole domain of artificial intelligence? So at the top level, you have AI. AI is actually very broad, okay? So inside AI, you have machine learning. Okay, so if you look at the, these things here, you have artificial intelligence, machine learning is part of artificial intelligence. Okay, AI com encompasses computer vision, it encompasses linguistics, it encompasses a lot of things, okay? So machine learning, and under machine learning, there's a thing called deep learning. Okay, so where does generative AI fall, say? Generative falls, AI falls within deep learning. So it's a, a few levels nested underneath, okay, where, where generative AI is. As I say, the main difference when quite everybody got excited in 20, at the end of 2022, that was November of 2022, is because for the first time, AI was not just responding, regurgitating human knowledge. It was actually creating new stuff. So that's why it's called generative. It creates something new, okay? That's the, the main breakthrough of uh, ChatGPT and generative AI. So it goes from just perceiving and passing on the knowledge to creation of new knowledge. So people in the past, they say, well, AI can do it, but it's just playing back what human has passed on to the machine. Now, a lot of the new stuff, like for instance, you can ask ChatGPT to write a poem that didn't exist before. It's like, why do you write a poem in this guy's style and talk about this subject. So that thing that you're requesting, it did not exist before. It's actually a brand new creation by the machine. Okay, so that's why it's generative and creative. Okay, so for people who came in just to learn what's the latest and greatest <laughs> about AI, two things that I don't know where you've heard. Way, way, uh, way back in uh, about the, um, I guess uh, toward end of last year, everybody heard about what happened at OpenAI, right? Is that some old man somehow got fired and then he said, well, I'm going to join Microsoft. And then they say, no, 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 we're going to want you back and we're going to fire the board again. All of that, there's one reason why this thing happened. And one, was the, one of the reasons they say is because at that time, the developers in, inside OpenAI they wrote a letter to the board saying this, this thing, new thing is dangerous. What's the new thing? It's called Q-star. 
Okay, so I don't know you guys how much you have followed through reading through all Q star. Okay, so Q star, just I'm not going to dive too much into detail about the AI because maybe <clears throat> it's a subject for another seminar where I'm going to talk about AI in, in detail. But at least I'll mention two things that are relatively new since the end of last year. Okay, the last quarter of last of last year. One is Q star. Okay, so you may have heard about, I'll explain what Q star is, okay? And the other thing that is new is called Mamba. Okay, so I'll, I'll go over just quickly two slides on the, one slide each, okay? So Q star is made up of two things. One is based on Q learning. So that's why it's Q star. The star means it's almost like a synonymous to optimized version. Okay, it's a star. So there's a, in optimization, there's an algorithm called the star, okay, or a search. That means that it's sort of like a way to optimize. And it's combining uh, Q learning, that's why it's called Q star, it's Q learning and a search or a star. Q learning plus a, a star is Q star, okay? So Q learning is a way of reinforcement learning. I don't know what, uh, in the past, I've also talked about reinforcement learning. Is that it's basically a way to, to improve the output based on the reward and penalty system. You give the, the search or the, the chat GBT algorithm, it give you an answer or give you some feedback, right? And then you say, well, I didn't like it. So you, you reiterate. The, the reiteration initially was done through human feedback. It's called reinforcement learning through human feedback. Okay, I don't know, where's the acronym? Uh, RLHF, something like that. Well, right now they say, well, when, you know when uh, AlphaGo, uh, AlphaGo was banned uh, by Google DeepMind in, uh, in UK, they, they give the feedback by playing the game Go, machine versus machine, self-play. It's not playing against human. So it's not like human feedback. It's actually playing the game, many, many, many games with the machine. So right now the iteration is no longer with human feedback, but it's actually machine and synthetic feedback. Okay, that's one difference between the Q learning and the R re reinforcement. The R one is the A star. The A star is again, is that there's always optimization. So you try to find, there's a, again, uh, that's a one. But every time you find the optimization, you have local minima, you have the global minimum. And then you find the, you're trying to find the optimum. Okay. so. The Q star algorithm, without getting into the detail, maybe we'll leave it for another separate seminar, is combining Q learning and A star. Okay, so that's Q star, just in, a, in one slide presentation. The other thing that is new, when we talk about chat GPT, chat GPT was based on one architecture. It's called transform, transformers, okay? And right now in the, last few months, there's a new architecture called the Mamba. Okay, Mamba was done by CMU instead of uh, uh, Google. Okay, so Mamba, right now they find out that Mamba can do things because what happened was that in the transformer architecture, the thing was based on a quadratic. Quadratic means that things it takes a long time to, to actually converge. So now they have come up, come up with a Mamba architecture that is five times faster. So again, I don't have the time to dive into all the nitty gritty details of the Mamba, but if you want to walk out of this room and, and people ask you, well, what's the latest? What can you tell me the latest about AI? Mention QSTAR and Mamba. And I bet most of people probably have not really digested that one yet, okay? So you got that thing about the latest in AI, these are two things that are right now at the forefront, forefront of all the people who are working on AI, okay, researchers who are working on AI.
Okay. Okay. The other one is the convergence between the physical and the digital. So everybody heard about AR, VR, okay, augmented reality, virtual reality. And sometimes people say, well, what is the, the other thing is that what is the difference between a virtual reality versus the real world? Okay. Actually, that thing is getting blurred more and more. Okay. So the other concept that probably you have heard about is called the digital twin. What is a digital twin? A digital twin is a copy of yourself, but with only the digital data information. So it's not a twin. It's not a physical human being that's your twin, but it's a, your twin that contains only the digital information. So many times when you want to go and do something, some work, you don't need you to be there. As long as all your information re, re, regarding you is it contained the digital twin. The digital twin can also be a twin for not only a human, but it can be a twin for a machine, okay, or for a city. So let's say that you have you, you, inside a factory, you have a machine and a production line, and then you're trying to replace one of the machines in the production line. In order to remove that machine and be able to simulate it, you can replace that machine with a digital twin, okay? It's not a physical machine itself, but it can aid in the simulation of the whole line, okay, without losing that thing. Okay, so this is a picture. Again, the, the picture here is, is that on the left side, you have the physical world. The physical world is what we see around us, the, the chairs, the tables, ourselves, okay? And then on the other side is the digital. That's the things that is a copy that contains all your information. Okay, it's, it may be residing in the internet, it may be residing in the cloud. So it's, it's just a digital information. So once you yourself and then the digital, and then it's the combined. The real is your biological self. And the digital could be AI, it could be a machine, it could be a copy that contains the database regarding your information. Okay, and that thing is converging. So the thing is that there's a connecting between the two. Okay, uh, the real and the, the phys real and physical is combining with the digital and virtual. The two are combining, okay, and it's merging. So that's what's happening. Okay, another thing is that green technology. Well, uh, before, in my second life, my first life was semiconductors. My second life was in clean technology. Okay. At that time, it was called clean technology because they say, well, everything is to keep the environment clean. Okay. Now, they, the thing is reviving again. People now tend to call it green because people worry more about the environment. Make sure that the current environment is clean, sustainable, Okay, and also non-polluting, okay? So there's a lot of things under the bracket of sustainable or green technology. Example, EVs, electric, electric vehicles, they don't run on gasoline, but they run on electricity. Electricity does not produce CO2, okay? So that's one thing. Uh, everything related to EVs are batteries, for example, new batteries, because the batteries, technology right now today is really, really up, not up to power yet. It's not up to expectations. It takes too long to charge the battery. Okay. It doesn't, the, the distance that it can cover is not long enough. And it takes too long to charge the battery, right? So all of those are still deficiencies and why EVs are still, you know, sort of like getting there, but not completely there. And the other thing that relates to all this green technology and so on is the concept of circular economy, okay? So, so here in this slide, let me just quickly give examples of what green technology covers. Clean air, clean water, right? Uh, environment, protecting the environment, uh, dealing with waste, renewable energy, okay? And so on, those all are examples of green technology. Now, what the 
circular economy is the following. It's based on three, what they call the three R's. Okay, cut down on the waste, reduce waste. Second one is to reuse it. After you think you're done, just don't throw it away. That's, can you capture the whatever the output and then reuse it for the next product, okay? For example, let's say you have a bottle of Coke and it's made of glass. After you, you're done, instead of throwing away the, the crystal bottle, you send it to recycle, okay? And maybe they demolish the bottle and they use the, the glass for another purpose, okay? And the third one is the recycle. So re reduce, reuse, and recycle. Those are the three R's for a circular economy it means that whatever the final output of one product it feeds into the next product. Okay. Okay. So this slide talks about resiliency. Okay. So we're talking about right now people that people, one of the top worries today is about cybersecurity. Okay, that means that everything that we have, our own data, personal data, whenever it's in the, in the domain, in the internet, who owns our data? Does it, oh, is it owned by Amazon and Google? Or is it owned by us or by the application? So who owns the data? It really should belong to us individually, okay? But people are worried about uh, the data security, also, also the privacy. Whatever you want to divulge, you don't want everybody to know, okay? Otherwise they can be a false you, right? And then steal your information. So this is one of the areas this, in the Valley, Silicon Valley, there are a lot of startups that are working on cyber, cyber security, okay? The quantum computing is the one, one of the technologies, just like nuclear fusion. It's always like 10 years away. Okay. So, so, uh, so two things about quantum for people who, who have not heard my previous seminars, I've actually talked about all of these uh, technologies in a separate seminars. But tonight, since I don't have time to devote entire hour to talk about one specific technology. I'm going to just quickly mention some of the principal characteristics, okay? Okay, let me see, take a sip of water. Okay. Four things I want to, for people who are completely new to quantum computing, I want to make sure that you all walk away with four characteristics of, of quantum computing or quantum mechanics, okay? One is superposition, one is entanglement, one is tunneling, and one is duality. And I'll just quickly go over what they mean, okay? Okay, first of all, when, when we live in our current world, we live in a binary, zero and one, right? You, the transistor is either on or it's off. Well, in the quantum computing, there's a thing called qubit. Instead of a binary bit, it's a qubit. The qubit is a little bit different than the digital bit. Digital bit is either zero or one. In a qubit, it's almost like zero or one or and one. It could be in either state. It could be, as a matter of fact, in both states. Okay, it's almost like when you talk about toss a coin, you say heads or tails. Well, sometimes if the coin falls on the edge and it doesn't fall down, you don't know whether it's going to be heads or it's going to be tails. So it's also there's a thing where qubit is not only or, an or function, but also an and function. Okay, so that's superposition. Second one is called entanglement. Entangle means that there are two, uh, two elements and they are associated with each other. And no matter where they are, how far apart, say why is, people say, well, the, the, some exam, people have given an example of, to explain entanglement is like, you're having two twins, one lives on the West Coast and one lives on the East Coast. Jose. And then whenever the guy from the West Coast feels a little bit discomfort, the guy on the East Coast also say, oh, you know what? I'm also feeling a little bit discomfort. Now, they are living completely apart. 
but they feel a little bit about each other. So whenever one gets affected, the other guy gets affected. That's sort of one way to explain what entanglement is, is that even though physically you are way separated, but whatever happens to one of the elements, it affects also the other one. Okay, that's what entanglement means. Okay, there are two concepts. Is that people say, well, why is uh, quantum computing so fast? Okay, one of the explanation is called quantum tunneling. Okay, what is quantum tunneling? So whenever you say you're get, going from A to B, to from location A to location B, and you have to go and climb a mountain to get over the, to point B, it takes a lot of effort because you have to go up the hill and you have to go through the entire mountain and come down. Well, what happens is that if you're sitting at the edge of the mountain and suddenly you can just go through, there's suddenly a tunnel. So you don't have to go up, you have to, you don't have to come down, you just go through it. That's, quite, that's called, it's quantum tunneling. It's one of the reasons why quantum mechanics is so fast compared to the other traditional computing. Okay, the other concept is that called duality. So normally when we talk about physics, there's the particle and there's a wave. And quantum computing, it has both. It, the element is both a particle as well as a wave. Okay, so that's why it's called duality of a particle and wave. Okay, so one of the things that if you see at the bottom, one of the biggest challenges today about quantum computing is the noise. So you, you hear about, well, how fast is quantum computing? However, inter signal integrity is not that good. So whenever there's a noise, it can cause error in the, in the code. So that de derails. So right now, that's why it's so hard to do super com quantum computing has two or three limitations. One is that it has to be very cool temperature. Okay, so you have to go into very low temperatures. The other one is that the hardware to build the thing is very costly. It's very, it costs a lot to do the a, a quantum computer. So cost, low temperature, and the third one is the noise. Those are the three things why there's always many years of still away, okay? It's not something that can be done tomorrow. Okay, biometrics. Uh, this is something that you probably, one way or another, you probably have been exposed to biometrics. Uh, it's about recognizing your, your hand, your finger, uh, the, 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 the characteristic of your finger, or even looking to your pupil. I say every person has a different one. Even between twins, no two people, have, no two persons have the same pupil or the same hand fingerprint. Okay, so uh, there are many ways to recognize people. They are, they are recognizing people by the way you you walk. That's called gait recognition. And then there's other people that says so depending on or recognize faces or your or many things. So this next slide shows the many kinds of biometrics. Okay. So the way you sign your signature, sound, your voice is also different. The way you type, how fast you type, how you type it. Okay. The way you walk, you know that between every person that walks, some people walk with a long, long, Long step. Some people go short step. Okay. Some people lift your legs higher, lower. All of that you can distinguish one person from another person. That's called gate. G A I T. Gate recognition. Okay. Fingerprint. We already talk about hand scan, iris, pupil, retina, face recognition. All those are different kinds of biometrics. So they say that basically. Uh, They say that by 2025, that's only about a couple of years away, uh, no longer people will no longer be using passwords. They can immediately tell you from another person via this uh, biometrics. Okay, so that's the reason why I'm mentioning about biometrics. Okay, Web 3.0. We mentioned at the beginning of the talk that one of the characteristics about the year is that everything is going decentralized. Before, everything used to be centralized. So for instance, you go to a bank, everything information is contained in the bank, okay? Right now, there are mu multiple copies. 
and everywhere, and many people own it. So a typical example are things like blockchain and Bitcoin, is that there are multiple copies of that thing. Okay, it's not just residing in one single place. So the thing about web, what are the characteristics of what the web 3.0? Okay, there's AI, there's ubiqu ubiquity means everywhere. Okay, uh, enhanced connectivity, peer-to-peer -peer networks. That means that it's distributed and you have many people who own it. Okay, and once you have it, all your peers have a copy. Okay, 3D graphics, also the meaning, semantics means the meaning of the word. Okay, so this one, it will take a, a little bit of time to evolve. Okay, so right now we're still between 2.0, it's also not 3D yet. So things are still moving. So this one will start picking up more in this year. Okay, cloud computing. So we already talked about cloud computing. So I'm going to quickly go from this slide we talk about cloud and edge to this picture, okay? So everybody knows what the cloud computing is. All our information, everything that requires very large storage space or very fast, it's very computing intensive. We cannot afford, everybody, every one of us cannot have a supercomputer at home. So all the high computers, high fast computers, they're all, owned by the big companies like Amazon, like Yahoo, like Google. They're in the, what they call the server farms. They have a lot of, you know, high computer, high, high capacity computers, high performance computers, okay? So everything that requires a lot of computation, we don't do it in our own PC. We send it to the cloud. Also it requires a lot of data to store it. We don't have enough storage in our own PC to pass it on to the cloud. So the cloud is for high speed and high storage. Okay, but there's a different need. So let's say right now people are talking about uh, self-driving cars. Well, the car, whenever there's a person walking down the, the sidewalk, the thing has to stop right away within seconds. So you cannot wait to send the information to the cloud and if the if the call is busy and then you don't get a response, you already ran over the person. So the computational and the speed has to be right there at the device. The device could be your car. Your car has to know, oh, there's a person walking there. I need to stop right away. Okay, that's the device. The car is a device. Your your uh, watch, your PC is right. You are using it. You're looking at it. And you need a response right away. That's called low latency. That means that response before you send in the request to the time that you get the answer is called latency. The time that it takes to go and back and come back. Okay. And you require real time response. I cannot wait for two or three minutes. And then they find out, oh, by the way, the internet is down. So sorry, I could not get the data. So things already happened. That's not, not acceptable. Okay, so that's what I call real time. So you have the cloud and you have the edge. The edge is right, not, right where everything is happening. And in between there's the called the fog. <laughs> the fog is sort of like in between the cloud. The cloud is, let's say, you know, so many meters above earth. The, the edge is where you're at the ground level and the fog is in between. It's a little bit lower than the cloud, okay? but it has uh, characteristics of both. So it's like in between, okay. Okay, next generation software development. So uh, a lot of people are in hardware, some people are in software. So more and more people are worried about with the chat GPT and all this stuff and say, well, do people need to code anymore? Sometimes you just tell the machine what you need and the, the machine will write the code for you. Okay, so a lot of next generation software development people say either low code or no code. You pass on to the machine what your requirements are and the machine will write the code for you. Okay. Okay, I want to make sure I'm, I'm monitoring the time. Okay, so this trend. So let me just uh, quickly jump to the next slide. 
actually, okay, maybe it's in, in the second part of it. I'll go over the difference between the, the traditional coding versus the next generation coding, okay? So I'll go over, maybe it's in my strategic portion of it. I'll talk about next generation software development. Okay, but the idea here to mention is that it's going from traditional human codes the thing, and now with ChatGPT, you can ask the ChatGPT to help you correct the code, find the box of the code, or write code that you know you don't feel like you, you've done a good job optimizing it. Okay, to later on it'll be actually you don't need to code anything; you just describe what you need, and the machine will generate the code in whatever language that you you want. You know, whereas uh, C plus plus or Pascal, or whatever language. Okay. Okay, so, okay, advanced connectivity. The reason why I'm looking at it is that in my slides always get blocked by the Zoom frame, okay? It's always blocking by the, the title of my slide. So I have to look down and say, okay, advanced connectivity. So connectivity, when we understand connectivity, most for most people we're talking about the cell phone, okay? So you have the cell phone, and you use Wi-Fi, you say, you, you're walking any place, okay. Is there an internet when you're walking to McDonald's or to Starbucks? Okay, that's uh, Wi-Fi, okay. But but now it encompasses a lot more, okay. It's not just your cell phone. Right now, everything, everything requires connectivity. For instance, when the plane is flying, when you're, you're driving and you're using GPS, you tell you where your location is. You, you need that information, the connectivity. Okay, so right now the latest because of, you know, if you look at the Russia-Ukraine war, the reason why Ukraine was able to fend off Russia for a year is because he actually used a lot of the Starlink technology. So they could tell where the Russian planes and ships and so on were, or, or the ground troops were, using the satellite as a way to view things, okay? So that's another connectivity. So whenever you are in a not densely populated area, say let's say you are in the middle of an ocean or you go mountain climbing where there's no relay stations. Well, how do you connect with the rest of the world? You have to connect, go up to the satellite and then from the satellite you're able to get the information. Okay, so that's satellite. So this picture at the bottom, it shows all the three components. You have all the Wi-Fi, you have the underground, you have all the relay stations. And then you have right now, for instance, drones flying in midair. And then above that, you have the satellites that are in outer space. Okay, so that's advanced connectivity. Okay, so that's the end of the first part. That means the technologies that will, you know, will track in 2024. Okay, so the next one, I'm going to move a little bit beyond 2024 and go into between 2024 and the end of the decade, which is 2030. Okay, so those are maybe a little bit more far. It's not happening this year, but somewhere in between. Okay, but they're starting now because they are already, the decade starting 2020. So what, 10 years? Okay, but not everything gets done right away in one year. So. Okay, so these are some of the things. Some of these I'm going to quick, quickly and then just dive into the slide. So in this slide, I think what I want to show is just list the 10 things that are strategic for the next decade. One is that next level process automation. That's also defined as RPA, remote process automation. Everything is getting automated from the robots to our daily tasks, everything is now taken over by the machines, okay? And it's also being done automatically. So process automation and process virtualization. So some of it, it, it may not be something that's real, but it's just done, getting done in the background as a virtual thing, okay? Future or connectivity, we just talk about the connectivity at many levels. Distributed infrastructure. So some of this you see repeated because the decade, of course, includes the year 2024. 
Okay, so there may be some repetitions and there's maybe some that are, are not just within 24. Distributed infrastructure, next generation computing. Okay, so we talk about quantum computing and neuromorphic chips. Neuromorphic chips means that chips are resembling more and more the way that human thinks. Neural networks and so on, okay? Also AI. AI is moving from just people who do research on algorithms and machine learning to actually applications of AI. Okay. Future of programming. That's where I'm going to talk about the difference between future programming versus traditional programming. Okay. Trust architecture is related to this. Do you trust the, the platforms and the, the things, right? So it's, it's sort of like cybersecurity, resiliency, trust, privacy, okay, and ownership of data, who owns the data. Bio-revolution, we talked about also earlier about genomics. We'll, we'll talk about a little bit more about farming and so on. Materials, so that's another thing that's very important. I remember that many years ago, a friend, many friends of mine, they asked me, say, my kid is going to college. Uh, Bill, why, why would you suggest them to pursue something that they make sure that when they graduate, they still have a job? Because our, some things move so fast. Like people say, I went into that major, by, by the time they graduate, the thing field already turned gold, cold. Okay. And then at that time, my advice was always two things. Is that as long as you study materials, you never get outdated. <laughs> I pray Shang Wan prayer will be the first one to concur with me. Everything that is related to materials, the materials may change, but they're always going to be fundamental. Okay, no matter. Uh, uh, today, for instance, we're talking, still talking about lithium ion batteries. Now it's the next generation of materials. Okay, everything is that there's a new material. Talk about nanomaterials, we'll talk about graphene. Okay, all of that is, is never going to go old. So if you do your study in that area, you may change from one material to another material but your domain knowledge is still very useful <laughs> because you're just changing, evolving. But it's not like, oh, suddenly, well, well I studied all this and now what good is for me? Now, me, when, when about two years ago, the other area that I was telling people that you should go into and make sure that you still have a job by the time you graduate is actually data science. Data science, data analytics, okay? Because the data is becoming more and more. Before it was called big data. For many years, it's called big data. That means that too much data. Well, big data is useless. It's too much data, it's, it's no good. What you, you want is a really good data and selective data and small amounts of data that are useful, not a humongous amount of data that you cannot do, know what to do with it. Okay. So, anyway, data science was that one. Okay. Uh, so, here, number 10 was also clean technology. So, it's sort of like reinforces what we said in 2024. Okay, so I'm going to quickly jump a couple of people online who are interested in some of these slides, you can send me an email, I'll be glad to send you the information. Uh, this slide just shows you why all these 10 technologies are important because they have very big impact, okay? And what are the impacts on? Is this next slide, if you look at the top, of the slide, healthcare, mobility. Mobility means transportation, getting from one place to another. Okay, industrial, that means consumers and so on. And then fin finally, enabler sector, that's IT and telecommunications, the advanced connectivity. So all the 10, here one through 10 are the 10 technologies for the next decade. And these are the areas where all these 10 technologies will be impacting. So why do people always talk about healthcare? Why do people always talk about education? Because that's every one of us has to deal with it. It's not like no matter what domain you are, no, no matter what line of work you are in, everybody has to watch for your health, your, for your health, right? And also to career advancement, education, and people say, well, what should I study? All that hopefully will stay on with you for many years. Okay. So process automation, uh, in a nutshell, okay, here, and then here are some examples about process automation. 
Right now, people are talking more and more about robots. So what good is AI? AI only tells you, but it doesn't do it for you. You need to have a mechanical device like a robot that can execute, okay? So you say, well, how do you uh, prepare an omelet? Okay, they give you a menu. Say, so, well, you get the onion and the egg and all stuff. And... But is there anybody or, or anything that helps you do, make the omelet? No, unless you have a robot, <laughs> okay? So, so there's a knowledge and then there's an action. In order to have action, you have to have some mechanical device that helps you do it, okay? So robotics, automation, 3D printing has been for about 10 years. And the only thing that's changing is actually materials. When they 3D printing started, it's always making plastic stuff, which is just not really that useful. Then they find out that you can do 3D printing using metals. So you can make car parts or plane parts in metal, not only with plastic. And then you can make a cake or a pizza. If you use the material flour or chocolate, you can make food, okay? So it depends what you put in as material. It, it creates a different uh, output through 3D printing. Okay, this slide also captures a little bit about the advanced connectivity. You can see that there's some sort of repetition, but it sort of reinforces what is hot, okay? So in the advanced connectivity, there are three areas. 5G, two years ago, I used to talk about 5G, okay? By the way, you know 5G? 5G is the fifth generation. It will last from 2020 to 2030. So when people saw about 6G and all that stuff, well, that's just advanced research. 5G, it goes from 2020 to 2030. So until after 2030, 6G does not start. So don't get too much into 6G because 6G is, Still 80, uh, you know, six years away. Okay. 5G, the other thing that is hot right now is Internet of Things, you know, sensors and uh, the edge. When we talk about devices on the edge, that's the Internet of Things. You have many, many devices, you know, from your toaster to your car <laughs> to your house. Okay. Everything, Internet of Things. And the, the last one is LEO, low earth orbit. So all the stuff that Elon Musk is sending through and the Amazon is also sending satellites to the, to the space. It's because they want to control the low earth orbit. Low earth orbit is the orbit that's closest to the earth. There's a low earth orbit, medium and high, okay? high Earth orbit, that's far away. So low Earth orbit is the closest to the Earth. So the lower you are, the faster response because you're closer to the ground. But because of the curvature, you need, need a lot more satellites because your area they can cover is also smaller. The higher you are from the planet, the more vast area of the, of the Earth you can cover. But the response time is going to be slower because the distance is much higher between the Earth and the satellite. Okay, so anyway, these are the three things. If you want to talk about advanced connectivity and people just want to test you how much you know about connectivity. You mentioned 5G, don't, don't jump into 6G, okay? 5G, IoT, and LEO, okay? That's the quiz. Okay, distributed infrastructure, again, uh, I think I mentioned already, everything is, that's the trend. And this trend has been with us for many decades. If you look at the traditional, when computer first started, we all deal with the mainframes, remember? Power with uh, IBM 360 and all this, the Cray and all this stuff. And then you went from the mainframes to the mini computers, the DEC. And then from the deck went to the PCs. And then from the PCs, it went to the cell phone, right? So everything is more and more distributed and everything is closer to us, okay? So I'm going to just stop there because I have many things to cover. Okay, quantum computing. Okay, I think I already explained in the first part, 
If you remember four things about computing, the duality of wave and particle, the superposition, the entanglement, and the tunneling. If you didn't know those four, you already know more than 50% of the population, okay? If you can mention those four, I bet you talk to average Joe, they probably won't be able to even tell you what those are, okay? So say, oh, I, I heard it from Bill, okay? In the, one of his seminars, okay. AI, everything is that, okay. There are, there are many questions about AI because why? AI is affecting every one of us. But the same way I described it in my last seminar, you don't have to be a PhD in AI. If you know how to use AI, it's almost like how many of us can actually disassemble a car and put it back? Not many people. But every one of us can drive a car. So we're using it, but we don't need to have, we don't need to have be a car mechanic. So AI is the same. You don't need a PhD in computer science to say, oh, I know about AI. As long as you know how to use it, is it good enough? Okay. That's another word trend that's happening. It's called democratization of AI. That means all of us can use AI. But we not everyone has to be an expert in all the algorithms, like Mamba, <laughs> right? A Q star. All of those are very few. You you have when you walk out of this room, you already have learned more than the average show. So you you actually you you one hour that you spend here is <laughs> actually worth your money. Okay. Okay. So apply AI. Okay, this is about the code, okay? So uh, future of programming. I'm going to just jump also over this slide. The future of programming. I want to show a slide between the way that traditionally programming was done because I used to be a programmer as well. Uh, you know, most of us who work in EDA, we have to understand hardware, but we also need to code, okay? And right now the code that will be in the future is gonna be different than the coding of the past. So this slide shows you the difference between the next generation code versus traditional code. Okay. So you can read a little bit. Just read the second bullet of each item. The skill set is going to be different. Before you say, okay, well, I need to learn how to code in C++. And I need to learn about this operating system. Okay. Pretty soon, pretty soon, this is another thing called democratization of coding. You don't need to be a programmer now. You just need to be able to describe what you want and what you need. And then the machine with the generative AI will create the code for you, okay? So that's the difference. The skill set is different. Before you need to really know how to code, you need how to debug, Okay, now is that, can you communicate to the machine what you need very succinctly, okay, very clearly, okay? Also agility. So you need to be able to change much faster than before. Before, every time you go and write a long piece of code, you have to make a change. You have to dive into the nitty gritty of changing the code, okay? And very time, very often you go and change the code and you make a bug, okay? So most of people who are work on code, the main thing is not to write the code. The, the hard part is to maintain the code. Is that there are so many bugs in the code. So when I was working in Cadence, there are people who develop the code and then there are people who most of the staff is actually maintaining the code. Oh, one customer reported this thing doesn't work. But people say, well, go and find out where's the bug. Okay, or well, why do you make that enhancement, right? I mean, everybody who has dealt with programming knows that that's the challenge of programming. Okay, a lot of that will be changing. Okay, so maintaining code will be easier. They say either low code or no code. Personally, I think that the in my own experience, it's always middle of the road is the best. If you let completely the machine do it and you don't know anything about it, is not really the best. The best thing is to have the human 
and the computer and machine work together. Okay, so the human knows what is what to tell the machine. The machine knows how to do it, but you iterate between the two. You do reinforcement learning that sometimes are made by the humans because you don't want to let the computer just run amok. Okay, so once in a while, the parent or the human has to tell what's wrong. Okay, so that's why my, my belief in everything is middle of the road. Don't go with one extreme where you don't leverage the automation of the technologies that like AI. On the other hand, don't rely 100% on AI. You want to give it, but you still have 20% or 30% control. So never go with either extreme, okay? It's not a matter of zero and 100. It's always between 20, 80, 30, 70. You make the call how much is you and how much is the machine, okay? Okay, zero trust. So zero trust, this is regarding to the, the thing we were talking about cybersecurity and uh, resiliency, okay? So this is why there are so many companies in the Valley who are into cybersecurity. If people, it's always afraid whenever you pass on your personal information to a machine or to a organization or to a company, you never can trust your personal data information to somebody else, okay? So as a matter of fact, my view is that regarding data, so we are living in the era where data is what they call, data is the new oil. Everything relies on data. But who does the data belong to? Does it belong to each of us? Or does it belong to Google? Does it belong to the bank? Does it belong to whoever you pass on the information to? Or is it to us? No. My personal viewpoint is that data related to us it should be owned by us, not by the organization you give the information. So very I very seldom pass information to Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter because you don't know what they're going to do with it, okay? So your own data, if you don't safeguard it, nobody, people say, well, great, we have so much data. We'll sell all the data to people who want it, okay? And then the person who suffers the consequences is you, okay? Okay, oh, so this is the part where we talk about uh, Health and agriculture, I think. Again, I, I get blocked always. My title always gets blocked. Um, okay, so this is related to bio, bioscience. So there are two aspects of it. Everything related to living things. There's here us, the humans. So that's called the human, our health, human health, okay? The other thing is to say, okay, if you want to go and talk about Crops, that's also a living thing. A plant is a living thing, okay? So whenever right now we talk about genetic engineering, is that how the agriculture, how do you improve the vegetables, the plants? How do you improve them, okay? So people remember the, the days where the apple and the peach are combined and you get a new, a new fruit, right? Okay, so all of this is being now experimented because of genetic engineering. Genetic engineering can apply to humans, genomes, as well as plants, okay? And, and uh, other organic living stuff, okay? Okay, materials, as I mentioned. What are the changes in materials? Whenever, whatever we're dealing with today that are not doing their job, like lithium ion batteries, for example, we need to find the next material that will be superior than the current material. The other thing people look, look for is that the new materials are getting smaller and smaller. That's why when people talk about materials, first thing they talk, oh, nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is the things that we cannot see with your own naked eye because they're too small. Okay, but 
the the next generation, for instance, we for the last when I was into semiconductors, our basic building block was the transistor. Okay. The next, the future, the basic building materials is not going to be a transistor. It's going to be almost like a molecule. You won't be able to see with your naked eye. Okay. So that's why it's part of nanotechnology. Nanotechnology has been around for many years, but more than 10, 15 years. <laughs> okay. And there are many dangers of nanotechnology. For instance, I don't know where you guys have heard the story of people who used to work say in the IBM laboratories and so on, they were playing with the nanomaterials. And unbeknown to them, they were getting exposed because all the particles were so small that will go through their gloves and they get affected that they didn't know. So a lot of people pass away <laughs> after the fact they realize, oh, maybe it was something I was working in the lab. And even though you, you thought you were protected because you were wearing gloves, the thing is so tiny that it goes through the, the glove material. Okay. So graphene is another wonder, what they call one of these wonderful materials. Okay, renewable energy. I think renewable energy is my, my second life. It's the first life was semiconductors. <laughs> second life was renewable energy and clean technology. So here I, I listed four areas where clean tech was was uh, active and it still is energy now we're talking about okay renewal of nuclear energy nuclear energy is not renewable energy but it's a clean energy okay it doesn't pollute okay even though it's not like it, it, it lasts forever renewable is like the sun and the wind you use it tomorrow there's new sun new wind okay so there, there's unlimited that's what renewable means Okay, also it means clean water, clean air, okay, batteries, transportation is basically all the EVs we're talking about, okay. Uh, right before this uh, seminar, we're talking about hydrogen. Hydrogen fuel was maybe one of the next ones. Okay, right now it's eight o'clock, so I'll try to wrap up in about five minutes, okay, and then open up for Q&A. Okay, materials we're already talking about. Okay, perfect timing, my last slide. Summary and conclusion. So we, we went over 10 technologies that are in the forefront of 2024. Then the next thing to reinforce or supplement that, we will talk about also the top 10 technologies that are going to be with us, not only in 2024, but for the rest of the decade. Okay. And underlying all of this, if you summarize, if you talk about trends, there's always increasing automation, things that you let the machine automate, whatever is still letting humans keep doing it, you pass it on to something else that can do it faster and better and doesn't get tired you know, from humans, right? Simplification, that's what another thing that I do daily. I have so much, so much junk in my house. I always say, okay, let me get rid of this. Give it as a present, donate it, sell it in eBay or whatever. Simplify your life, okay? So that's a trend not only for us, but society as a whole. And also consolidation. If there are too many things, you know, like, I don't know people who are into investment, okay? People say, never buy more than two hands, okay? The best is to just deal with about five or six. If you have too many, you already get lost, okay? Consolidate. Things you can consolidate into mutual funds instead of buying a lot of uh, individual company stocks, okay? And also just buy right now today, uh, it's called, I think, MAMA. MAMA is the, not the new acronym, okay? Before it was, uh, what was it called? FAN, before it was called FAN, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. And now it's called Mama because it changed to Microsoft and Meta, soft Meta first, the new name of the company, uh, Apple, Amazon, right? So some of that. So anyway, 
If you into stocks, just buy five of those. That's it. Forget about the rest. <laughs> That's a separate segment. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Before I open up for q and I want to give, usually when you go to the movies, you go and watch the movie and they give you a preview of what's coming. <laughs> so for people who make q and for the next seven days, but not pure technology. It's not just cloud and AI and whatever. The talk, if if I get to do it next month, I don't know yet because I may go on a trip or whatever, but that's, I already have the material done for this talk. It's called most in-demand skills. And most in-demand skills, when people talk about skills, there are two kinds of skills. The hard skills and the soft skills. Okay. So, Hard skills are the ones like the technology we talk about today. Cloud computing, AR, VR, okay, data science, analytics, cybersecurity, nanotechnology, all those are hard. Those are domain specific knowledge. Okay, this is where you go and take a course or you go to school, okay. That one, for the soft skills are what they call the interpersonal skills. Is that when you go and join a company, how do you work with your co-workers, okay? How do we create it? You have also related to, to the hard part is that you need to be digital literate. Today you go to a company, and you, you will say, you don't have all the requirements that we need. Okay, so it requires digital literacy, data literacy means that you just tell me I have a lot of data, but you don't know what to do with the data. You don't know how to analyze the data. You don't know how to consolidate and simplify the data. That's not good, okay? Uh, a lot of things like leadership, time management, continuous learning. There was even another one called persuasion. Be able to persuade the other person, okay? So anyway, this is the upcoming talk. It's about most in-demand skills, circa 2024. Okay, so I'll open for any questions for the people uh, here in the room. I don't know, people who are still uh, men and uh, uh, I guess um, uh, phone, is that if you want to send some, inf uh, some of the questions from uh, the Zoom people, okay, you can send them to me. So, so any questions here in the room? Howard? There's a, uh, talking about this before we can. Uh, I think in the next uh, few years, even from the beginning now, AI will eliminate many, many jobs. Lawyers, accountants, right. programmers. And those that who are eliminated, it will be very difficult to find a lot of jobs. So, so what are we going to do? So that's why I listen to my next talk. <laughs> my next, the most in-demand skills, it talks about this issue. It's called reskilling. Is that because all the technology is moving so fast? Before last year, there was no G generative AI. So before it, the people who wrote all the Hollywood plays, they used to create their writing. Right. They write the script. And now they have Chat GPT say, why do we need those people? Yeah, yeah. I can't just give it to Chat GPT. Yeah. It can create a matter of minutes a new script, right? So a lot of things that that so that's called reskilling. Is that no matter where you're new to the job marketplace or you are already working, but you say, well, how does it affect my current job? Is that going to be something that automation that is going to eliminate my position? So you need to go and reskill. You move from one thing that you did not know before prior to the AI and say, no, how do I make an adjustment? That's called reskill. The problem is, uh, suppose before, you know, not here, you have 100 people. No, for you to be skilled, probably only that So right. still 90% people get eliminated. Correct. Right. So that's correct. But that's the fact of life. <laughs> and, and and I'm personally just like Sean and Howard, we're happy that we're retired. <laughs> 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 so we don't have to go say, well, what do we do now? <laughs> yeah, so but, but but for the people who want to, you're absolutely right. 
That's the, remember the thing I talk about automation. Before it used to take 10 people to do the job, now it requires only two people. So what happens to the eight people? Okay, now if you look at the long term, there are a lot of people who say, maybe in a few years, nobody needs to worry about jobs because all the jobs will be done by robots and by machines. And we just need to retire. But that's what they call that the everybody has a basic income. You, even if you don't work, you have, you, have, you have money to live. Okay, but that's a little bit too philosophical right now. It's too far away. Okay, so I would say, uh, I would try to instead right now because we're talking about the 49ers, I will try to just punt for now for the question for how. I'm not going to give you a complete touchdown pass, okay? Let's say, wait for next time, okay? And if my next talk doesn't answer your question, we'll defer it to the next seminar. That, that keeps my job, see? <laughs> Actually, I'm not doing it for the money. <laughs> but, but say, how do you sustain? You, you find a job that you like. You do it even for, for no pay, right? That's the thing where we, are, we are have the luxury of doing that. <laughs> but not everybody, everybody says, well, I still need to pay the rent. I still need to pay the gas, you know, and the food, right? Okay, any other question? Yes. Yeah. Duality and tunnel. Yeah. It's good. That means that you're listening. <laughs> So, so I think AI is right. It can give us a lot of meetings, but I think also sometimes it can give us uh, some mm -hmm. uh, scams or uh, fake news. Uh, those are getting harder and harder to identify because of the, the AI technology we have right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to answer in two parts. Mm -hmm. With every technology, no matter where it's AI or anything, you know, quantum computing or anything, any new technology, it's just like fire. It's a double-edged sword. Every technology has a benefit, but it also has some drawbacks. Okay, so that's the first thing you have to realize. You cannot escape. There's no such a thing that's only for good. That's no problem. Okay. Now, what do you do? How, what do you deal? How do you deal? Distinguish between real and fake. I have a, as much hard time as you do because right now you hear a lot of news and you don't know where it's a real news or is it somebody who invented. Okay, I don't know where there's a, the most recent incident was that they had a picture of the Pope. He was wearing one of those puffy jackets, and actually that picture was not really the Pope wearing a a, a puffy jacket. It was actually an image created by ChatGPT. Okay, so. But in order as a consolation, just as like people, there are people who are playing the new creative stuff. There are also other people working on how to prevent and how to decipher. For example, when ChatGPT first came out, that was the main objective. All the people in school, they say, well, all the teachers were complaining, well, the, the students are no longer writing their own essays. Okay. Or the root, the people are you know cheating when they're doing their homework. So immediately what came out is they already company school. To say, okay, we can tell. We, if you run the the thing that people choose a minute, they can tell you what they okay. AI generate that. <clears throat> so what I'm saying, I'm I'm not giving you the complete thing. Is that for everything that you develop, there are also other people who are worrying how to beat the cheaters. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not saying that who will win. Okay, <laughs> okay, but what I'm saying is that there are always people. So immediately when the chat video came out, about one month after. You say, here's a tool that the, the professors can use to tell where the homework and the, the, the essays that is the students submitted was real or was done by them. So, you know, anything can be done with technology, good and bad. So I think that, the, but I think to your point is very valid. For the average person, it's, getting, it's going to be harder and harder for us to tell the person. And we don't have time to say, well, let me validate whether the thing I heard was true or false. Okay, so that's a dilemma, right? But there are people who are investigating. Just like people say, well, how do I steal the information from another bank? Then there's another app who say, let me work in cybersecurity, right? So there are people working on, on, on both sides of the equation. Okay, uh, the one in the middle is that people say, well, I don't have to go and validate and verify whatever. So sometimes you can 
cheated and we can misled, right? So that's something that we are we are all facing. We're all facing. We are, everybody's facing. Okay. Yes. Yeah, two things. A Google Corporation <laughs> sent out a, a class that starts with Debian. Yeah. It's starting for that Tuesday. It's a week starting all of next second yeah. class. Yeah. And so I just recommend everyone to sign up for it. It's from um, today's what, the 17th. So it's from January 16th to like February 24th. It's twice a week. So from 9 to 10 30 a.m. So I just recommend. Yeah, there, there. It's unbelievable how many courses are there. It's from there, right? Right, right. I know, I know, I know. You have to make it the official Gemini. Yeah. What I'm saying is that there are so many courses. So, the summary is the following: We're living in an era of big data. Okay. Yeah. That means there are so many courses, so many lectures that you can hear all for free. Yeah. Okay. The the challenge is the following. Is that how do we deal with the big data problems? There's so much material, but the quality of the material is endless. Everything from large corporations to how we you know, do, do a very good job in teaching mm -hmm. to any average joke and put a, a YouTube video. And sometimes you can't even understand the English, right? Because they speak with accents and so on. So there, what I'm saying is that I'm not critiquing the, the authors of these things. But the variety is up to you to make a call as to which one you select to listen. And I agree with you on the YouTube video. Mm -hmm. There's so much. So stuff. much. And but there also some of them are talking about, oh, China's got 6G they're working on, and you mentioned about 5G. And it's not just here, but with satellites and the moon and yeah. stuff like that. We don't know what this means. I mean, there's so much out there. It's so much like watching. Right. Yeah, you know, so for now, at least regarding six G, <coughs> don't pay too much attention. There are people working on six G. You know, just like there are other people working on advances of other AI. Right. But it doesn't mean that it affects each of us because right now in the between 2020 and 2030, we're all using 5G. Until you hit 2030, it's not six G. It's, it's then you will start with six G. Okay. So if you are into that domain, you can go say, and let me find out what's going on in CC. That's for okay. If you are an person, I want to know, but it's not impacting us. Uh, okay, that's fine. But for AI, looks like it could be very powerful even to generate some music. Now, my question is that uh, mm -hmm. for sickness, for example, cancer, can AI have to find any new drug for cancer? Theory? Is that happening or no? No, no it's, 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 everything is ongoing work. So you, when AI came out, depending on the domain that you're in, let's say you're a doctor and you're doing research on finding a cure for cancer. People say, well, let's explore what AI can do for us, okay. right? So what I'm saying is that AI right now is pervasive through all areas. It's from education to healthcare, to transportation, to banking, to business, you know, all areas. So depending what was your domain, where you're inside, well, people say, how can AI help me? See, let's say I'm a teacher. You say, well, how can I get the information? How can I get AI to prepare my class materials? For instance, if I'm a teacher, right? So if you're a doctor who are researching into cancer, say, well, can, can AI gather all the information that is already aver available, let's say, and condense it? Like right now, for example, you don't have to read a book because you can ask ChatGPT, summarize this book for me into one page. So instead of reading 300 pages of a text, you can say, summarize it. So for people who are doing research, say in cancer, there's so much material. But if you can leverage AI, they, that will in increase your speed work, right? Because you have to don't have to read. Instead of reading 30 articles and takes you six months to read it, now you can read the, the synopsis of it and you can say, this is good and this is no use for me. So everything increases your productivity. Okay, But it doesn't mean that that everything is already done. As a matter of fact, you, you don't forget one thing. Everything that so far AI, the, the domain knowledge that the machine has 
aside from the creative, creating new music and creating new poetry, a lot of information is actually fed by human, that was, information that was in Wikipedia, information that was in the books. All of that, so if, so let me give you an example. Let's say I'm AI researcher, okay? And I'm working in the MIT laboratory under a certain professor, okay? I'm working with a new algorithm. Mamba 3, okay? Do you think that AI already knows about Mamba 3? No, because that information has not fed into the, the domain knowledge of the AI yet. So it's, a it's, a he, he, he's not going to surpass the speed that, after all, all the new things still being created by humans. Okay. okay. <clears throat> there will be a point, I don't know when, where maybe the machine will be more creative and can do it faster than humans. But today, everything that is in the domain knowledge, I remember when ChatGPT just came out in 2.5, said, well, the data is only good till September of 2021. Why? Because any information after that is not captured, right? So now it's getting better. Okay, and who knows? Maybe in the future you will surpass. People can extrapolate. Besides knowing this thing, you will extrapolate. Okay, but right now, for instance, like cancer, research or stuff, it's not going to find something, a cure that people are still working in the laboratory. So when they say AI like a mutant, it's not really like a mutant, it's just a company. They have all different pieces for them together, but still compiling them, not to create them. You know, yes and no. For example, let me give you an example where I think it is created. So let's say image generation. Let, let's do away from the text. Text is mostly just a, you know, knowledge that are in the, Wikipedia, so. So let's say that you want to create a new image. That's also generative AI. Okay. It creates a new image instead of creating a new text, okay? So yes, let's say that, okay, for example, there are many, so many examples. Draw a map of a, draw a picture of a dragon the way that Picasso would draw it. Okay, that doesn't exist today. It doesn't, Picasso never drew, say, a dragon. Okay, now you're asking the tool to create a dragon, but in the style of Picasso. Okay, that's new. It doesn't exist today, right? So that means it's new, right? But on the other hand, for things that are like, for instance, you're doing cancer research and you have to go to the lab and you have to look at the combination of things in order to come up with a cure for, for a thing. The AI doesn't have robots to do the thing experiment for them. Say, okay, let me combine. It can do very fast processing. If you have 100 elements here and 50 elements there, it can combine all the combinations very fast. Okay, but it doesn't have the robotics or the mechanical way to go to the lab and, and say deal with the rats, deal with the, the other things. It doesn't have the robot mechanism yet in place. So I'm not saying that we, we don't know how far or how soon this will happen, but that is not here yet. Okay. I'm just telling you, you know, January of 2024, <laughs> I'm not saying, you know, who knows what will happen by end of the year or next year, but that's the current state. So in addition, uh, one last thing on top of the time, about, when we keep talking about API over and over, yeah. and that's a general term too, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So let's assume it's a big thing, but what do you think AGI, if you were to guess it, you know, it be, and, it, and again, it's so big, but that word's actually being used in this country. What do you think? Okay, I have an answer. <laughs> I'm not going to give you exactly what year. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you another scientific lemma or theory. Sure. There's a saying that says, people tend to be too optimistic on short-term achievements. So people say, well, we're gonna have a self-driving car. They've been selling that for about three to five years ago, mm -hmm. and we still don't have it, okay? Mm -hmm. For short-term expectation, people tend to be too optimistic, mm -hmm. okay? So they always, underestimate how long it's going to take for the thing to happen. 
On the other end of the spectrum, things that are longer term, people say, oh, we'll have quantum computing in 10 years or 15 years. Mm -hmm. Guess what? It will happen before that. So people are too pessimistic about long term. <laughs> you actually happen before that time. So that's one thing to, to, to tell. Okay. Now, uh, again, coming back to, I guess, your most immediate question. Please remember. Yeah, question. Here when you oh, AGI. I remember now. I remember your question. Okay. So, first of all, let me share with you what's the definition of AGI. Mm -hmm. AGI it stands for artificial intelligence by general, yeah. Art general artificial intelligence. Okay. If you think about it, up to now, most of the AI has been uh, specialized. Now, for instance, I, I, I have an AI machine that can play Go. I have an AI machine that can play chess. Okay. It does one thing. Cannot do feed the walk the dog for you, right? So that's called not general. Mm -hmm. In order to reach a, a general AI, okay. it's still many years away. Yes. Why? I'll tell you why. It's not going to happen in the next two years or three years. Why? Because the current AI that we see right now, which is called based on LLMs, large language models, okay. is all test driven. Is that right now what LLM does is that you feed it a question in your prompt and you place with words. Okay. And it creates based something with based on that. Mm -hmm. But it's not based on logic reasoning, it's based on word playing. Right. So unless you, you have a, a machine that can think like a human, you're not going to you're never going to, you're, in the short term, you're not going to be able to find a AI that can do general, what a general person can do. We can, we can study AI, we can uh, balance our checkbook, we can do tax returns, we can cut the grass, we can learn how to pay, uh, paint and how to drive and all the stuff. In order for a general AI that can do all of that, it's not here yet because the, even the technology that they're using right now is not based on human risk. It's based on a language model. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so my answer, I don't expect anything within five years, for sure. And the reason why I, I even go, I personally think it's going to be uh, longer than that. But the thing is that right now, nobody can tell the speed that things can happen. So what I tell you right now in January 2024, is suddenly there's a big breakthrough, <laughs> you know, that, they, that's going to, that is able to think like a human. Not just uh, doing like m doing word word puzzles. Uh, say okay, well, if I give these five words, uh, what's my next word? And then you can create a a, a essay from you. Method is not right. Academics, But but right now, most of the people are still based on the all the advances, even the Mamba, the transformers. They're all good for. LLMs, they're for lang language based stuff, not for human logic reasoning. Right. Yeah. Okay. I have a question in terms of the second sure. mm -hmm. uh, You talked about a lot of these like, technological advances <coughs> since the previous uh, thing is the dimension of the right. technology. But then, the purpose you said that the nuclear. The answer is yes. And let me explain why. When whenever I say is I just need to back up why. Most of our concepts right now about nuclear energy is based on the traditional nuclear energy. That means the large plants, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, you know you have to deal with cooling. You have to deal with uh, what do you do with the materials and what happens if it leaks into the air? 
All those are based on a traditional large nuclear plant. But right now the progress is going to a more modular and more smaller and decentralized. So you don't have to deal with it. Well, what happens to the waste? But they cancel the first deployment. Hmm? They cancel the first deployment. I said not in Ida. You mean the, the burying the, the waste into the underground? Yeah. 